The idea of God comes out of ignorance. Science today is explaining the things that primitive man held to be of the gods. Noah and the ark, Jonah and the whale. How can you teach that and expect anyone to take you seriously? We're not against things like God and prayer. It's just that they have no place in institutions of higher learning. Most of the great pioneers of psychology looked upon Western religions and biblical moral standards as the cause of most of today's psychological problems. It's our responsibility to the students to prepare them to live in the real world, to help them to stand on their own two feet. At some point, they have to recognize things like Santa Claus, Jesus, and Superman for the fiction they are, and to start looking to themselves to solve their problems. If it were up to me, I'd fail any kid who didn't believe in evolution, and I'd be doing him a favor. Passing him would be like sending him on to algebra when he didn't believe 2 plus 2 equals 4. Darwin demonstrated very nicely that we don't have to make up some great general contractor in the sky in order to get a handle on life in our universe. Sigmund Freud, the father of modern psychology, said it best. Religion is the great obsession of neuroses of our day. We really have to wean our students away from dependence on such drivel. At first, we didn't mind some of the English classes studying the Bible as literature, but we had to eliminate that. There were some who wanted to take the book literally. It's a very dangerous book. It teaches narrow-mindedness and breeds wild-eyed fascism. Today, anyone with any competence realizes that God is just a catch-all word in which man puts things he doesn't understand. Well, science is clearing up all of the mysteries. Seventy percent of young people who have been raised in the church will reject their Christian faith during their high school and college years. That's seventy percent evangelicals. That's Bible-believing young people. If the Christian faith is not true, then the rejection is as natural as coming to understand the truth about Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. However, if their Christian worldview is true, then they have departed from the truth into error and confusion. Dr. Norman Geisler, author of the book, false gods of our time. The goal of this film series is to examine the evidence. Our objective is to show that there are sound intellectual reasons for the faith our young people have made a commitment to. We want to stimulate them to think through their faith and to know what they believe and why. The Bible states that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Yet the popular view from the academic community is... I'm a confirmed atheist because as an educator and science teacher, I find no rational basis for believing in God. Well, what about that? Is there a rational basis for believing in God? Before we answer that question, we have to decide what kind of God we're talking about. There are three major views that are being promoted today. Atheism is the belief that no God exists. The universe is all there is. Though he claims to be an agnostic, Carl Sagan, the astronomer and popular host of the PBS series Cosmos, would be a good example of one who promotes an atheistic worldview. For him, the cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. Atheism and its offshoot, secular humanism, recognize man as the highest form of life that has evolved on Earth. Man then becomes the replacement for God in this belief system. If man worships anything else, it would be the cosmos. Pantheism is the belief that God is everything and everything is God. God is not personal, but rather a power or universal energy of which everything is a part. While pantheism is primarily the basic theology of the religions of the East, today it's being enthusiastically packaged and promoted to appeal to the Judeo-Christian West. The concept of the Force in the Star Wars films, for example, presents a pantheistic view of God. 
Theism, which is the view of traditional Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, sees God as the creator. He's infinite and personal. He's transcendent, meaning that he created the universe but is not part of it. A rough example that might clarify how a theistic God relates to the universe would be that of a painter to a painting. As C.S. Lewis has stated, God invented and made the universe like a man making a picture. A painter is not a picture, and he does not die if his picture is destroyed. You may say he's put a lot of himself into it, but you only mean that all its beauty and interest has come out of his head. So back to the question posed earlier about the possibility of a rational basis for believing in God. The God we will be arguing for is the theistic God of the Bible. I don't care what names or labels the different religions call it. The only thing out there is the universe. And it's always been around. Anything that has always been around doesn't need a cause. That's one of the major objections atheists throw at theists. Now remember, we're going to use the term theist for those who believe in a personal God who created the universe. So what about the atheist objection? It makes sense that if the universe has always been around, then a creator God is sort of excess baggage. But has the universe always been around? Is there any scientific evidence that would pull a rug out from under that idea? The second law of thermodynamics indicates that just as this candle is burning down, the universe is doing likewise. The universe is like a giant vat of actual energy that is being used up and not being replaced. It's being transformed into unusable heat. Now, if the universe is winding down, it can't very well be eternal. Eternal means without beginning or end. And if it's ending, it's reasonable to conclude that it had a beginning. Another piece of evidence for the idea that the universe is not eternal comes from the fact that the universe is expanding. Let's say this balloon represents the universe, and the dots are galaxies of stars. This also represents the size of the universe at a certain point in time. Well, according to science, at a future point in time, the universe will have expanded, the galaxies and stars and planets having all moved away from each other. It's also true that earlier in the history of the universe, it was small, and everything was closer together. The only thing out there is the universe, and it's always been around. On the contrary, the evidence of science is that, one, the universe is winding down, which means that at some point it must have been wound up. Two, the universe is expanding, which means it had to have a point in which it began to expand. As far as I'm concerned, the universe just happened. How or why isn't important? For those of us who want to be rational about this, I think it is important. You see, from the beginning of science, it was based on the premise that every event, everything that comes to be, has a cause. Many would call the cause of such a gigantic event God. If everything that exists had a cause, then God must have had a cause. Who or what caused God? Let's back up a moment. Some atheists claim that the universe had no beginning, that it's eternal. The only thing out there is the universe, and it's always been around. And things that have always been around don't need a cause. We agree that anything that's always been around doesn't need a cause. And we pretty well covered the evidence that the universe did indeed have a beginning. But what about God? Since God is not part of the universe, he is not running down. Hence, he had no beginning and so he needs no cause. Just because the universe exploded into existence doesn't mean some all-powerful creator made it happen. Evolution has shown that the universe is a product of time and chance. There's no need for a personal god pulling strings. Hey, check out the blazer. I wonder who left it here. Well, I don't see any evidence, no footprints or tracks. I'd say it evolved. It what? Yeah, you see, it could have started with a spontaneous explosion millions of years ago. And over the years, it's been getting better and better. And what we're seeing now is the latest stage in its evolution. So when does it become a Rolls Royce? Uh, well, I think that's a different species. I think you're a different species. So who do you think left the blazer here? Who did leave it here? Well, that's definitely the right question. 
since the vehicle itself is obviously a product of some form of intelligence, did you notice a simple form of communication on the side of the vehicle? If you were to come across this sign or even just these words etched on a rock in the middle of the desert, what would you think? Probably an intelligent being caused it to be there, right? Because even a relatively simple sentence demands an intelligent communicator. Would you argue that Webster's unabridged dictionary came from an explosion in a printing shop? The basic idea that a relatively complex message demands an intelligent being as a cause is a very important point. Even atheist scientists apply it to programs which search for extraterrestrial life in the heavens. such multi-million dollar projects, it becomes the major point of rationale for their very costly research. An example is astronomer Carl Sagan, who is involved in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, known as the SETI program. He has stated that the receipt of a single message from space would show that the transmitting civilization, after all, has survived. He's presuming that a message indicates a civilization of intelligent beings. Now, the irony of all this is that such men refuse to apply the same reasoning to the overwhelming evidence of complex information found in the organization of the first living thing. That's like saying a radio message of SOS came from an intelligent being, but that all the information in a whole volume of a large encyclopedia has no intelligent cause. So what are we saying then? Well, we're making another rational point for believing in an intelligent creator. The point being this. A cause that regularly produces highly complex information and design is an intelligent originator and designer. And by regularly, I mean that's the way it's found in our normal experience, over and over again. We never see anything of this kind of complex information happening by chance. The universe, especially all living things, reflects highly complex information and intelligent design, which quite reasonably indicates a highly intelligent creator. It really seems to me that the best argument against a personal God out there somewhere is all the evil and injustice in the world. Those who believe in a God who is morally good and can only be good see evil as a product of man's rebellion against God. Evil is the choice man makes when he decides not to do good, just as when man chooses to love or not to love. You can't force love on anyone. Force destroys love. Now, given free choice, which is the only condition in which love or good can exist, mankind, by choosing neither to love nor to do good, has initiated and propagated the world's horrors. Theists believe that God will do away with all evil in the future, forever. Yet the outcry of the atheists that there is no justice in this world is something we should consider. of Hitler? Well, he was the worst. How do you figure? Easy. I just compared what he did with what you're supposed to do, and he got the lowest grade possible. But where'd you get what you're supposed to do? You know. What's right? But how do you know what's right? I mean, what's really right? That's an important question. How can we know something is really evil unless we have an objective standard of good? How can an atheist complain bitterly about the injustice in the world unless he has some standard of justice? Before C.S. Lewis became a Christian, he argued against God by pointing out that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. Then he asked himself, but how had I got this idea of just and unjust? Man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. Just as if there were no light in the universe and therefore no creatures with eyes, we should never know it was dark. Dark would be without meaning. So what's the point? The point is, even those who don't believe in a moral, just God recognize immorality and injustice. 
which means there has to be some ultimate standard of morality and justice. Theists claim that this source is God. I'm a confirmed atheist because as an educator and science teacher, I find no rational basis for believing in God. That's what we already considered. Is there a rational basis for believing in God? And we came up with the following. Number one, everything that has a beginning has a cause. Number two, the universe had a beginning. Therefore, number three, the universe must have had a cause. So atheists must believe nothing caused the universe. Theists believe something, God, caused the universe. Which of these two is more rational? Further, the universe contains living things which possess highly complex information and exhibit very complex design. But the only scientifically known cause for complex information and design is an intelligent creator and designer. Atheists believe it all happened by chance. But science isn't based on chance. It's based on knowing a regular connection over and over again. Which of the two is more rational? Conditions like injustice, evil, immorality, and hate could not be considered unless there existed a standard of justice, good, morality, and love. Atheists recognize conditions like injustice, but refuse to acknowledge that there's an ultimate standard of justice, of good, and morality. But there can be no moral law without a moral law giver. If you're coming to the opinion that theism, that is the belief in an intelligent moral creator, may be rational, then what of atheism? Surely the greatest non-theistic thinkers, the champions of reason, have been totally rational in coming to conclusions about God. Or have they? Albert Einstein, when first confronted by the evidence of an expanding universe, wrote, this circumstance irritates me. To admit such possibilities seems senseless. The brilliant scientist wasn't objecting to the scientific validity, but rather to how it irritated his view of God as the universe itself. Is popular astronomer Carl Sagan being reasonable when he declares, if we must worship a power greater than ourselves, does it not make sense to revere the sun and the stars? I'm in Red Lion Square in the heart of London, standing next to the bust of Bertrand Russell, one of the most famous philosophers of the 20th century. Russell died in 1970, and one of his most famous books is a little one entitled, Why I Am Not a Christian. In it, Russell argues that we don't need to posit a God because if everything has a cause, then so does God. And if God doesn't need a cause, then neither does the universe. And in either case, we don't need to have God. This is Charles Darwin's study. It's in this place that Charles Darwin did his work. In fact, Charles Darwin used to sit in this chair right here, and he would take a, a lap board and place this lap board uh, on top of the arms of the chair, and he would write in this position. In fact, it's in this position that he wrote uh, The Origin of Species, which was published in 1859. I have a copy of The uh, Origin of Species. In fact, it's the original edition that Darwin produced. This book is one of the most influential books in the entire world. It started a revolution in scientific thought. Charles Darwin is one of the most important figures in modern history. In this book, Charles Darwin said that all forms of animal life evolved from a simple form of life that emerged out of a primeval pond, which Darwin referred to as a little warm pond. Karl Marx, the founder of modern communism, states plainly the objective of evolutionary theory. In our evolutionary conception of the universe, there is absolutely no room for either a creator or a ruler. Who said atheists don't believe in absolutes? If it isn't obvious by now that reason is not the main criteria for atheists, the following quote from Science Magazine puts it in perspective. The theory of evolution itself, a theory universally accepted, 
not because it can be proved by logically coherent evidence to be true, but because the only alternative special creation is clearly incredible. The famous German atheist Friedrich Nietzsche best underscores the problem in his statement, we deny God as God. If one were to prove this God of the Christians to us, we should be even less able to believe in him. According to his biographer, Nietzsche spent the last 10 years of his life in an insane asylum in anguish over such beliefs. In the book of Romans, it says that all men, without exception, know about God. Yet they suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Since the evidence is clear, and many of the atheists mentioned are brilliant men, it becomes obvious that atheism does not result from any lack of evidence that there is a God there. It's not a mental dilemma, but a moral one. Not a matter of the head, but a matter of the heart. The psalmist put his finger on the problem when he said, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Okay, I'm not into spiritual things, all right? But if I have to pick something that's going to be God to me, then it's got to be something that I see, like the ocean, the waves, the sand, things like that. No, I don't believe there's a God. Man's the highest intelligence there is. He's, uh, he's complete and sufficient in and of himself. He, he doesn't need religion. Well, I believe in the personal God of the Bible, the God who's given us the... Uh the free will to have a relationship with him and well he's the God who created the the heavens the universe and, and life itself in our last program we discussed theism which is a view that sees God as the creator of the universe which he made not out of himself but out of nothing we also learned that such a view of God as a personal creator is not irrational as some have claimed but is logical and consistent it's consistent with what science has found to be true about the makeup of the universe for example, reason dictates that everything that has a beginning has a cause. Now, the major findings of science indicate that the universe had a beginning. And since the makeup of the universe demonstrates order, complex information, and design in all living things, and a sense of morality within each person, theists believe that such evidence demands a personal, intelligent, moral creator. In other words, God. But there are other views of God besides the theistic one. What about the pantheistic or polytheistic views? I'm into yoga and meditation. So I read a lot in the Eastern religions, such as Hinduism, Buddhism. And I believe God is the all, and everything is God, and God is everything. Well, I believe that just as there is a God of this planet, there are gods of other worlds in the universe. In fact, my religion says I can become one. If you ask me, there's this... Uh just a universal mind out there and it's like one big thought that we're all sort of connected to. I think there is a God, but he obviously needs help because things are so out of control in the world. Not only are various views about God different, but when people try to combine the views, things really get confused. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. He was one of the great prophets like Buddha or Muhammad or Gandhi. All religions are basically the same anyway. They're different paths that eventually end up in the same place. The God of the Bible is just like the force in Star Wars. He's in every one of us. It's just some people aren't aware of that yet. I don't think we're really tapping into our full divine potential unless we understand that we're part of God. When people consider God, there seems to be no end to the different ideas they come up with. And you might say, well, God's a big subject. He's infinite. So there's no end to what you could say about him. And in a certain sense, that's true. Yet some of the views that we've heard were contradictory. For example, compare these two views. Well, I believe in the God of the Bible, the, the personal God who gave us the, the free will to have a relationship with him, and he's the creator of the universe and the heavens and, and life itself. God is not a creator, but an impersonal force, like the energy that exists in everything. So to me, God is not a he or a she, but an it. So although there are many ideas about God, if they are contradictory, they can't all be true. 
in this second show of the series, we're going to examine the major views of God that differ with theism. And we're going to major on the differences because that's the only way you can tell a counterfeit from a genuine. Ravi Maharaj is an international speaker and author. His autobiographical book records his experiences as a Hindu guru and his subsequent conversion to Christian theism. Since pantheists believe that everything is part of God and everything is God, all is one, all is divine, they would also say that all paths, no matter how different or how contradictory they may seem, lead to the same God or the same goal in the end. Biblical Christianity alone stands outside Hinduism's attempt to draw all religious beliefs to itself, especially because Jesus himself said that he alone was the only way, the truth and the life, and that no one comes unto the Father except through him. In my extensive travels throughout North America and Western Europe, I have met a tremendous number of people who are deeply influenced by Eastern religions. Eastern beliefs and practices which are largely centered in pantheism are now almost commonplace. Most Westerners do not realize that a religious conversion is taking place. My cousin teaches yoga down at the YWCA. She says it's just for physical exercise, but she does a lot of meditating. What's meditating got to do with exercise? I thought yoga was a Hindu religion. You know, my aunt thinks she was reincarnated. How did she get that idea? Well, she was going to a psychologist to lose weight, and once when he hypnotized her, she started talking in a strange accent and in a man's voice. Anyway, the psychologist told her she regressed back to a former life. My dad had to go to a business seminar once, and the speaker was promoting new age ideas. Like what? Well, they told him he had an infinite potential to do whatever he imagined, that he was basically divine, a part of God. Oh, well, did he buy it? Well, he complained to the personnel manager, and he told him that that was the latest in management theory. Hey, you remember that weirdo who was always hanging around with your cousin? You mean the guy who was heavy into drugs? Yeah. yeah. Well, did you ever notice how he always was talking about auras and karma and being one with the universe, meeting spirit guides and leaving his body? Well, I remember when he was straight, he didn't have a clue to any of those things. Hey, uh, what do you think of the Force? Which side? The dark side or the light side? Darth Vader's side or Luke Skywalker's side? What, are you saying the Force is both good and evil? Oh, man, I know. I was thinking the Force was supposed to be God. Pantheists believe that God is an impersonal force and everything is part of the force. If that's true, then everything that's good is part of God and so is everything that's evil, like disease, depravity, and death. But pantheists, especially of the Christian science variety, protest that disease, sin, are only the consequence of wrong thinking. Nevertheless, no pantheist has been successful to the extent of never getting old and of living forever. Pantheists say that the whole of the material universe is not real. It's an illusion, like an imaginary oasis appears to a dehydrated man crawling through the burning desert. Nevertheless, a pantheist who drives his car into someone else's car ends up with more than a smashed illusion and a good deal more than his imagination broken. Pantheists claim that man is really God, but his problem is that he just hasn't realized it yet. However, pantheists also claim that God is the unchanging absolute. However, if man has to change from not knowing he is God to realizing his own godhood, how can he be the unchanging God? It's not reasonable. Pantheists pride themselves in not being rational. They believe mystical experience is the only basis for knowing God. Reason is part of the illusion that keeps one from knowing God. Yet if you cast off reason, how can you decide whether the mystical experience is real or an illusion? The pantheist claim that man is God has another problem. How did the pantheist ever come to such a conclusion without reasoning to it? I wouldn't deny that pantheists have experiences. They major in experiences, mostly of the mind-altering variety through yoga, meditation, drugs, hypnosis, and so forth. On such mind trips, they claim to experience God. But how do they know? Well, many will say that it can't be explained. It's an inexplicable inner experience and all of that. Nevertheless, they must have had some reason for deciding that they were experiencing God, which is puzzling because pantheists tell us that you can't trust reason. It's an illusion. 
Polytheism is the belief in many gods. Egypt was known for its many gods. Here at the pyramids and in the surrounding areas, there were temples and gods in multitudes. These are the gods that the Bible says that the plagues of Egypt came upon, the, the gods of the river, the gods of the sky, the gods of frogs. Actually, polytheism is not simply an ancient belief, but polytheism has resurrected in the 20th century and is now coming from east to west and is practiced even in the United States. Polytheists don't believe in an infinite God beyond the universe. Their gods are limited in power and operate in certain domains of the natural world, usually associated with natural phenomena, such as the god of rain or the sun god. Some are also believed to be overlords of many aspects of life, from fertility to war to beauty to love. Some are made to cover whatever may be the problem of the day. Religions that worship more than one god may seem like a throwback to ancient times, with little relevance to our modern Western culture. But actually, polytheism is a thriving belief system. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as Mormonism, has over five million members. They believe that God the Father and Jesus Christ are two separate gods, and that numerous Mormon males will someday each become a god, the father of their own world. Many within the ecological movement believe that the only way mankind will be motivated not to destroy the natural environment we live in is to return to worshiping the gods of nature. Many within the women's liberation movement have turned back to the female deities and goddesses of the past to underscore their total rejection of anything smacking of dependence upon a male figure, most particularly a chauvinistic father god. Occultism, which is growing at an alarming rate today, utilizes the idols of the gods and goddesses of past civilizations as points of contact with the entities of the spiritual realm. In many cults that are popular in the Western world, there is a polytheistic belief in an ascending masters of wisdom. There is also a renewed interest today among kids for godlike characters, which we find in games like Dungeons and Dragons with its underworld deities, and in popular toys such as He-Man and She-Ra, god and goddess of the masters of the universe. So what's the problem with polytheism? Well, you've got lots of gods and lots of confusion. Some are supposed to be good and others evil. Some are a mixture of both. Some are more powerful than others, yet no one seems to be in charge of the entire universe. So while you certainly have diversity, you have no real unity. No one's in charge of the whole show. So there's no assurance that anything good will ever come about. In fact, as their stories indicate, most of the time, the gods are the real problem. Life is one continual cat and dog fight among the goddesses and gods and between mankind and the gods. This is about as beneficial as worshiping a cast of today's popular soap opera. Another difference between polytheism and theism is that theism's truth claims are based on rational evidence that can be historically and scientifically verified. Polytheism, on the other hand, has no historic evidence to support it and therefore has to be accepted on the basis of a blind leap of faith. The Bible is a historical book. Many of the great historical events of the Bible occurred right here in Egypt. It's here that Moses led the children of Israel through the Red Sea. It's here that Jesus spent some time when he was a child. The Bible's not a book of myths. Throughout the land of Egypt and in the Middle East, archaeologists have uncovered hundreds of thousands of finds that support the Bible uh, to be the Word of God. In the 8th century BC, Jerusalem was besieged by Sennacherib, and in order to divert the waters so that the enemy armies would not get them, this tunnel was built. The exact tunnel that was recorded in the pages of Second Chronicles, which the critics have long said can't be trusted, has been unearthed by the archaeologist and is a living testimony to the accuracy of the predictions and the statements made in the Word of God. Housed in the great museums in the world are hundreds of thousands of archaeological finds which support the biblical picture. The authenticity of the Old and New Testaments are confirmed by 
numerous things that can be found in these museums. Right here in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, you'll find thousands of things that support the biblical world. For the skeptic, for the agnostic, for the atheist, I invite you, come, see, and believe. Atheism is the belief that no God exists beyond the universe or in it. Atheism says that the universe is all there is. No God exists anywhere, at any time. As the astronomer Carl Sagan says, the cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. Charles Darwin, the father of evolutionary theory, replaced the creator of living things with natural selection, a process in which all living things evolved into existence. One of atheism's first cousins is secular humanism. Secular humanists also hold that the universe is self-existing and therefore has no creator. However, secular humanists do have an object of worship or commitment, mankind. According to the Humanist Manifesto, no deity will save us, we must save ourselves. Karl Marx, atheist communism founder, adds that man is the highest essence of man. Humanist psychologist Erich Fromm believes that God is not a symbol of power over man, but of man's own powers. So atheism is not merely the absence of belief in God, it is also the active belief in a God substitute, either the universe, nature, or man himself. One popular atheist writer underscores the militant position of many atheists today, especially in the field of education. He said, it's my purpose to demonstrate that the belief in God is irrational to the point of absurdity, and that this irrationality, when manifest in specific religions such as Christianity, is extremely harmful. In attempting to put its money where its mouth is, atheism attacks the belief of theists, that is, those who believe in a personal, transcendent, creator, sustainer of the universe, in the following ways. Some atheists state that theists believe that God is self-caused, meaning that he created himself, which atheists regard as completely irrational. No one can exist before he exists, including God. Atheists are correct in stating that God cannot be self-caused, but theists don't claim that God was self-caused. God didn't cause himself. God is uncaused. He's eternal. The universe, however, had a beginning, so it must have had a cause. Theists believe that the cause of the universe was the personal creator God of the Bible. Atheists are in a more difficult position. As a leading atheist philosopher points out, according to the Big Bang Theory, the whole matter of the universe began to exist at a particular time in the remote past. A proponent of such a theory, at least if he's an atheist, must believe that the matter of the universe came from nothing and by nothing. The atheistic beliefs that deny a creator depend totally upon time and chance to produce an ordered result. Inasmuch as the atheist's stated chief objections to theism are, one, that it is irrational, and two, that the universe has no beginning, you have to wonder if their real objections are indeed intellectual. The different views of God or of the gods that men and women hold are not just ideas that have no real meaning for their lives. The beliefs we choose or reject affect all aspects of how we live. For example, a pantheist who believes in the law of karma, meaning that one has to pay in this life for sins of a past life, will not be inclined to alleviate anyone's suffering. To do so would have an adverse effect on the sufferer's next life. The pantheist view that self is God and can only be realized through introspective practices such as meditation and yoga, coupled with the view that the material world inhibits God realization, inclines even the casual Western practitioner toward withdrawal and self-centeredness. In situations in which a pantheist does become involved in the social or physical welfare of others, it's not because of his belief stemming from pantheism but rather the effect of other beliefs, such as Judeo-Christian theism, which have influenced him. However, trying to mix the two belief systems isn't necessarily helpful. One example is that of Project Hunger, a Western organization that promotes Eastern pantheistic ideas. 
Millions have been spent to raise the consciousness of the world about hunger because they believe raising consciousness is the ultimate solution to eradicating the problem. The idea is that the great universal mind of the universe will change its thoughts about hunger when enough of little minds get together to influence it to change. Atheists, by rejecting God, have no ultimate basis for moral law. Without a God who prescribes what is right and what is wrong, there's no basis for moral absolutes. Because to have an absolute law, there must be an absolute lawgiver. So then whatever seems to work at the time for the majority is implemented. Laws become a jungle affair with only the strongest surviving. Any true basis for right and wrong ceases to exist. Without a standard for morals, it doesn't make any difference what goes on. However, even atheist societies cannot live under such conditions. So they create their own standard, which becomes an absolute for them, whether it's nature or the state or their own self. As we have seen, there are specific differences in the various beliefs about God. And these differences show up in the actions and objectives of those who hold such views. For example, when you compare pantheism with Christian theism, it becomes clear that their view of self is contradictory. Pantheism teaches self-deification and is primarily self-oriented, while Christian theism teaches self-denial and is basically other-oriented. Christian theism's other orientation has manifested itself in ways that have affected mankind for centuries. Critics of Christian theism will waste no time in pointing out that the Crusades and Spanish Inquisition should be viewed with what you've just seen. However, the Crusades and Spanish Inquisition didn't reflect true Christian theism, just as the Indian guru who has a pension for owning dozens and dozens of Rolls Royces was not consistent with the non-materialist beliefs of pantheism. Since people run programs, there's always the problem that they may deviate from orthodox positions no matter what beliefs they claim to hold. Nevertheless, most of our decisions in life are based on what we hold to be true. Behind me is the church where William Wilberforce attended. In 1833, he died having accomplished one of the greatest things in modern society. He was the Abraham Lincoln of Britain because William Wilberforce almost single-handedly in Parliament accomplished the abolition of slavery. John Wesley was an inspiration to Wilberforce. In 1791, he wrote to Wilberforce in these words, If God be for you, who can be against you? Be not weary in well-doing. Go on in the name of God and in the power of his might till even American slavery, the vilest that ever saw the sun, shall vanish away before it. Wilberforce accomplished that very inspiration. The point of this second program in this series was to survey the different contradictory views of God and to see if choosing any particular one makes any difference. Well, it should be quite obvious that it does. Even those who have spent their lives criticizing Christian theism, such as Bertrand Russell, acknowledge its significant effects. He said, for example, the thing I mean, please forgive me for mentioning it, is love, Christian love or compassion. If you feel this, you have a motive for existence, a guide in action, a reason for courage, an imperative necessity for intellectual honesty. The French atheist Jean-Paul Sartre recognized that there was also a definite consequence in rejecting the God of the Bible. He said, if God does not exist, we are not provided with any values or commands that could legitimate our behavior. We are left alone without excuse. Choosing a view of God that is false, whether in passive ignorance or in active rebellion, leads to destruction and death. The sobering consequences are clearly articulated in the first chapter of the book of Romans. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. So it was that when they gave God up and would not even acknowledge him, God gave them up to doing everything their evil minds could think of. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness and sin, of greed and hate, envy, murder, fighting, lying, bitterness, and gossip. They were fully aware of God's penalty for these crimes. Yet they went right ahead and 
did them anyway and encouraged others to do so too. When scripture describes an event as accomplished by God or God's will, we must understand merely that it was in accordance with the law and order of nature. As a uniform experience amounts to proof, there's here a direct and full proof from the nature of the fact against the existence of any miracle. Miracles must be admitted as not at all compatible with reason. They are nothing but natural effects. The day will come when the miraculous account of the birth of Christ will be classed with the fable of Minerva springing from the brain of Jupiter. The supernatural is being swept out of the universe in the flood of new knowledge of what is natural. A number of highly influential men down through the centuries have problems with the possibility of miracles. We're going to consider their objections in this third program of our series. But first, let's review some points that have been covered in the series thus far. In program one, we were challenged to determine whether or not it was reasonable to believe in a creator. Atheists said no. It's not rational because, according to them, the universe has always existed. Making up a creator is pure mythology. So we turned to science and good reason and discovered that the atheists were mistaken. We found the evidence of science to be overwhelming in support of the universe having had a beginning. And since it had a beginning, the universe could not have existed forever. We then reasoned that the universe must have had a cause because everything that has a beginning has a cause. So then we ask who or what created or caused the universe. In the process of exploring the possibilities, we discovered that who rather than what was the appropriate question. The reason being that the first living thing had highly complex information in it, and such information regularly comes from an intelligent source. As an illustration, consider the formations of Mount Rushmore compared with formations found in the Grand Canyon. The choice for their cause is either a non-intelligent being, such as wind or rain, or an intelligent being, such as a skilled man. Since we know that wind and rain do not regularly carve out the faces of Washington, Lincoln, Jefferson, and Roosevelt, it is reasonable to assume that the shaper of Mount Rushmore's stone faces was an intelligent being. Therefore, the more appropriate question to ask is who, rather than what, formed this monument. Inasmuch as the first living thing contained information a great deal more complex than the visual information of Mount Rushmore, we concluded that the cause of the universe and of first life is an intelligent being. Theists, that is, those who believe an intelligent being who created the universe and life, yet exist apart from it, call such a being God. In program two, we compared theism with other ideas about God, most particularly atheism and pantheism. Pantheists believe that God is an impersonal it, that everything is God and God is everything. In the pantheist view, God is considered to be an all-pervasive energy, a universal mind or cosmic consciousness. The force of Star Wars with its light and dark side is a contemporary example of a pantheist concept of God. Atheism is the belief that no God exists, yet we discovered that although atheists do not worship the Creator, they do have God substitutes. Some worship the whole universe or cosmos. Some venerate mankind as the highest form of life. And some pay homage to the state as a sort of overlord of man. We established in program two that there were contradictions between the different views of God and therefore they couldn't all be true. For example, God is either impersonal as the pantheists claim or God is personal as the theists claim. You can't have it both ways. We also determined that the views people hold about God greatly influence the quality of their lives collectively and as individuals. In the theist view, God, who is intelligent and personal, is not part of the universe. He exists independently of it. The question we're going to wrestle with in this program is this. Is it possible for God to intervene in the world, or is he locked out? In other words, are miracles possible? Miracle is a term that superstitious people use to categorize events they don't understand, just like the idea of God. Such things are made up by men ignorant of the laws of nature. Miracles are unscientific because they're improbable, 
unrepeatable, and unique. Science, on the other hand, deals with probabilities and regularities. So as a scientist, I have to reject miracles. Besides, since there's no scientific evidence that God exists, and miracles are supposed to be from the hand of God, there's no basis for anything miraculous. I thought we established that there was a good deal of evidence from science for the existence of a creator designer of the universe. So if he wants to disbelieve in miracles, then he'll have to disprove that God exists. That's been attempted by a number of great thinkers down through history. Bertrand Russell tried and could find no conclusive arguments. Astronomer Carl Sagan also came up short, stating, there can, of course, be no disproof of the existence of God. So as long as God's existence is possible, then miracles are possible. But what did he say about miracles being unscientific? Miracles are unscientific because they're improbable, unrepeatable, and unique. Science, on the other hand, deals with probabilities and regularities. It's true that science deals with regularities. For example, by observing that this apple falls when I release it from my hand, and it drops over and over again, seeing that the same result takes place, I can formulate a scientific law called gravity. Science also deals with probabilities. The probability that this apple will once again fall when I release it is very high because it's happened over and over again. The circumstances remaining the same, should the apple say on the 72nd drop, hang in midair for about 10 seconds, just that one time, even though thousands of attempts were made to see if the effect repeated itself, this single event would not be the basis of any scientific law. Why? Because it doesn't happen over and over again. So it's highly unlikely that it would ever happen again. This is the major objection to miracles of those who claim to be scientific. Since miracles are unique and unrepeated events, they are highly improbable, and the intelligent person should not believe in them. Well then, the next time you're playing bridge and you're dealt a perfect hand, the odds against which are 1 in 635 billion, 13 million, 559,600, According to what we've just heard, and since such a card hand is unique and improbable, be intelligent enough to ask for a redeal. Or if you happen to knock your drive toward the pin on a par three and by highly improbable chance it goes in, don't be foolish enough to believe it. Tee it up again. Common sense tells us that although such happenings are rare, they nonetheless do take place. No reasonable person would deny them just because they don't happen with regularity. I'd like to believe that you actually made that hole in one, but being a man of science, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to do it 11 more times. It seems then that those who reject miracles in the scientific community demand that the highly improbable be repeated. Even great scientific events like the origin of the universe are singular, unrepeated events. It happened once and has not been repeated since. If it is not obvious by now that the objection to past singularities is something that is preached but not practiced, consider a program called SETI, that is the search for extraterrestrial intelligences. With scientists such as Carl Sagan involved, the program is based on the belief that receiving a single message from outer space will indicate an intelligent civilization beyond our planet, even though such a message is received only once. The point being made with these different examples is that the so-called scientific objections that have been thrown at miracles have no real basis in truth, or as we've seen in practice. 
So those scientists who wish to eliminate miracles because they are not repeated over and over for our observation are inconsistent in believing in the Big Bang origin of the universe or the spontaneous generation of life. For these events are not being repeated over and over again either. resurrection is the crowning miracle of Christianity. The story is recorded in Matthew chapter 28. And the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Skeptics find it hard to believe the story of the resurrection. David Hume said, you can believe that people die and don't rise because that happens over and over. But to believe that someone died and did rise is a rare event and we have no one there to verify it, so the wise man must not believe in that. In fact, scientists take the same attitude often toward the resurrection. The very same scientists who deny the resurrection because it's a singular event in the past that can't be repeated over and over, believe in the spontaneous generation of life that happened in some primeval pond. They weren't there, they didn't see it, and it's not happening over and over. And yet they believe in the singularity. They believe in the process of evolution, but they weren't there, they didn't see it, and it's not happening over in the present today. So they believe in past singularities for which they have no direct evidence except the evidence that may come to us down through the ages. Christians have the same kind of belief. We believe in the singularity of the resurrection because we have evidence that has come down to us through the ages. It's the evidence of eyewitnesses. In addition to the specific objections that have been presented, there's a wider view which represents the belief that miracles do not or cannot take place. It's called naturalism. It's the belief that all existence and all events are part of and bound by the natural world. In such a view, God either does not exist outside the natural world, or at least he does not intervene in it. Therefore, miracles do not exist. Everything conforms to the laws of nature. While many atheist scientists profess to hold a naturalistic view, naturalism is also found in different religious perspectives. Contrary to the opinion of some, many of the founding fathers of this country were not Bible-believing theists, they were deists. If you're wondering what I'm doing with this New Testament, I'm repeating something Thomas Jefferson did. This is a Jefferson Bible. Uh, he was considerate enough to take what miracles there were in the Bible and to throw them away. He didn't think they were very helpful. You see, uh, deists don't believe in the supernatural intervention of God. They believe that the laws of nature govern everything that takes place. If they admit that God miraculously created the universe, what's the problem with him doing a few other things? They certainly didn't get the idea from this book. But then Thomas Jefferson was more inclined to believe in his own version. What can we now conclude from what's been presented? First of all, it should seem quite reasonable to accept that if God exists, as the evidence overwhelmingly indicates, miracles are possible. Although we haven't proven yet that they have actually occurred, we have made a strong case for miracles being possible. 
On the other hand, those who totally reject miracles cannot prove that miracles are impossible because they must first prove that God does not exist, which is itself virtually impossible to prove. Scientists who reject miracles do so on the basis that miracles are singularities. That is, they are improbable and unrepeatable events. Yet we found that they do, in fact, accept major singularities, such as the Big Bang and the spontaneous formation of first life. That is, events which happened only once and cannot be repeated. Even if you could prove that miracles do occur, you have so many contradictory religious nuts running around claiming psychic powers and miracles that it doesn't prove a thing about God. How can it? They all have different gods. That's a good point. In pantheism, there are hundreds of gurus performing incredible feats, so-called signs and wonders, which they say authenticate their claim to be God. false Christ in the world today and they make outstanding claims but they provide no divine confirmation of their claims Jesus Christ said I am God and he proved it by resurrecting people from the dead I'm here in Bethany at the traditional site of the grave of Lazarus Jesus had waited some time until he came here and when he arrived Lazarus was dead for four days his body was decomposing then he said Lazarus come forth and Lazarus came out of the tomb in direct confirmation of the claim of Christ to be the Son of God. As Nicodemus, the religious ruler, said, Teacher, we know that you have come from God because nobody can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. In Christianity, there's an absolute dependence on the uniqueness of its miracles to confirm the claims by Jesus that he alone was God who became a man. For example, without the miracle of the resurrection, there is no Christianity. Because unless Christ rose from the dead, Christians have no living Savior to worship. In addition, Christ would be no different from any other religious leader who ever lived and died. So those who do not believe in miracles have an objection which can be stated this way. All religions have the same kind of signs and wonders, which means they are self-canceling. That is, they wipe each other out of the picture. If the powers of the pantheist force are no different than what theists claim are miracles from their God, then both miracles and God go out the window. Because the God of pantheism and the God of theism, being in contradiction to one another, can't both be true. Yet if their miracles are the same, then at the very least, miracles are self-canceling and confirm nothing. This is particularly critical to Christianity because, as we've indicated, without miracles, there is no Christianity. Well, do all religions have the same kind of miracles? Or does Christianity have unique miracles which distinguish it from all other religious signs? If so, this would demonstrate that Christianity is true in contrast to all other contrary religious beliefs. Therefore, in our next program of this series, we will examine the radical claims of Christian theism. My guru Sai Baba is the avatar of the age, truly God in human flesh. His signs of healing, knowing the thoughts of others, prove his divinity. Rajneesh is Bhagwan, he is God. You only have to be in his presence to sense his divine power. Maharishi means great seer. His divine holiness alone has shown us the path to godhood. The Swami is our God. He gives me peace of mind. He imparts energy to heal. Even the dirt touched by the soles of his sandals has the power to set you free. In this fourth program of our series, we're going to further consider miracles, and in particular, the claims of Christian theism related to miracles. Theism, for those of you who missed the first three episodes of the series, is the belief in an intelligent, personal creator of the universe who is not part of what has been created. In those programs, we established the major objections to the universe having a creator were contrary to reason and the accepted evidence of science. 
Theists such as Jews, Muslims, and other Christians call the creator of the universe God and contrast to theism, pantheism regards it as an impersonal force which pervades the universe, a sort of cosmic energy or universal mind. It's part of everything and everything is part of it. We also established in earlier programs that if a personal God who created the universe exists, then miracles are possible. And by miracles, we mean a unique act of God who is not part of the created universe, who affects the creation in a particular way in order to demonstrate his presence and his purpose. However, some make the following objections concerning miracles. Even if you could prove that miracles do occur, you have so many contradictory religious nuts running around claiming psychic powers and miracles that it doesn't prove anything about God. How could it? They all have different ideas about God. That's a valid objection. And if it's true, because you have the same kind of miracles proving the alleged truth of two contradictory views of God, you have a major problem. This is particularly critical for Christian theism's truth claims, which are based upon the miraculous intervention of God. Why is it a problem? Because contradictory views can't both be true. And if the miracles are the same, then you have the question whether or not the miracles have any value in confirming the truth. But it is true that the miracles of differing religious views are the same, isn't it? Or is it? In pantheism, which is at the heart of Eastern religions, such as Hinduism, Buddhism, and New Age beliefs, and some of the cults in the West, there is an impossibility for a miracle. This impersonal god or force can't reach in from out there and uniquely affect the universe because he's part of the universe. So what they claim to be miracles, they actually consider to be special abilities by godlike individuals in manipulating the god force that pervades the universe. And while pantheists believe that we are all gods, even though most of us haven't realized it yet, those who perform their version of miracles are recognized as more fully realized gods. In other words, some of us have higher god powers than others. And the more spectacular the ability, the higher up the spiritual ladder one can claim to be. The Christ of the Bible lived and taught, died and rose from the dead here in Jerusalem. Today there are many challenges to the Christ of the Bible. There are gurus from the East. With me is Carol Matriciana, who spent 19 years of her life in India, where she encountered many of these false Christs. She's author of a best-selling book, Gods of the New Age. Carol, what's the difference between the Christ of the Bible and the God of the gurus of the East? The Eastern concept of God is that divinity is an it. It's an impersonal thing that is in the breeze, the trees, animals, and uh, in human beings. It can almost be compared to a sort of energy, a consciousness. In fact, Christ was referred to as a state of mind and not an individual. So that, in essence, a man can become God or man is to discover his own godness in the gurus of the East rather than there being a god beyond the universe. And one guru explained it to me like this. He said that just as a coin has two sides, so God has a good side and a bad side. Now what that did to me is made me think that I also had no sin. Actually, there's no forgiveness in this system. No, there is no forgiveness because nothing has been done wrong. There is no sin and there's no mercy. But obviously there's an innate feeling in human beings that we haven't achieved purity. So this results in a sort of work system and uh, one tries to better oneself in this life through reincarnation. Well, there are many people who think that reincarnation and resurrection are the same. The Christ of the Bible resurrected from the dead. Are these the same concepts? No, there's absolutely no similarity between resurrection and reincarnation. Resurrection is the raising of the physical body. Reincarnation is the idea of the soul going into another body again and again and again. Now, the resurrection from the dead is the crowning miracle of Christianity. Christ claimed to be God. He proved to be God by performing many miracles and then resurrecting from the dead. But gurus perform miracles too, don't they? Aren't they the same as Christian miracles? No, absolutely not. In fact, uh, I would say the majority of them are trickery and deception. Um, there's certainly no guru that I know of that's raised himself from the dead. Thus far, we've established that because God exists, miracles are possible. And the miracle claims of different religions are not the same. 
If Christ's miraculous claims weren't factual and unique, then no one should believe his claim to be God. As a matter of fact, if Christ isn't God, Christianity is the ultimate ripoff. Therefore, the crucial question remaining is this. Are its miraculous claims credible? One major objection is that the writings are unreliable, that the documents were altered over succeeding centuries, that they are mythological with no or little historical basis. Are those objections true? Out of all ancient literature, the New Testament is the most well-authenticated document. There are more manuscripts of the New Testament plus earlier and more reliable copies of original manuscripts or autographs of the New Testament than of any other work from ancient times. Some copies or portions of the New Testament can be dated as little as a hundred years from the date the autographs were composed. The New Testament survives in over 5,300 hand-copied manuscripts, while most other classical works survive in fewer than two dozen. Even with only 10 early copies of Caesar's Gallic Wars, through the application of textual criticism, scholars trust that such copies are accurate, that they're good representations of the originals. In addition, the time gap between the earliest known copy of Gallic Wars and its original is 900 years. The average time gap for early classical works is a thousand years. Scholars regard the closeness of time of the writing of an original text to the time the copies were made as important in maintaining the purity of the text. In other words, the closer, the more accurate. With a mere 100 year gap between the earliest New Testament copies and the originals, and considering the overwhelming number of copies, no other text from the ancient world is nearly as reliable as the New Testament text. Even if the biblical texts are accurate and reliable, that doesn't prove that what's in it is anything more than the drivel of some deluded holy men. It's pure mythology, as far as I'm concerned. Men such as American founding father Thomas Paine and British mathematician and philosopher Bertram Russell and even the famous missionary Albert Schweitzer all argued that the historical Jesus never existed. Some critics believe that the events could have been mythologized, yet that would have been difficult because the New Testament writers were contemporaries of Jesus, which means that there were plenty of eyewitnesses around to object to any distortions of the facts. It's commonly accepted that it takes at least two generations from a historical event to its writing for a legend to develop. Yet the New Testament was written by the first generation eyewitnesses. But were the events of Christ's life historical? Although Thomas Paine and Bertrand Russell and Albert Schweitzer were brilliant men, it seems that history was not their best subject. Early first century historians abound with references to Jesus of Nazareth, who is called the Christ. Tacitus, a Roman historian, wrote, Christus, the founder of the name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. The Jewish historian Josephus wrote, at this time there was a wise man who was called Jesus, and his conduct was good, was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. And those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. These secular historians wrote at the very time that Christ lived. Even the Christian writer Justin Martyr, who lived in the second century AD, referred to secular historical documents to support the historical acts of Jesus. He wrote, and that he did those things you can learn from the acts of Pontius Pilate. In actual fact, if we lost the very New Testament documents, it could all be reconstructed except for 11 verses from the manuscripts of early writers. So what can we conclude? Well, if you reject the historical basis of the New Testament, then you're going to have to throw out all of classical history. The New Testament is the best attested historical and biographical work we have of any classical period, event, or person. Skeptics say the Bible cannot be trusted. And one of the reasons for this is that some of the Old Testament was written before 1000 BC, but the earliest major manuscripts of the Old Testament came from 1000 AD. 
So we have 2,000 years gap. And they say, and during those 2,000 years, many corruptions and changes occur. So the Bible we have in our hand today can't be trusted. Well, back in the 1940s, in these caves behind me here, were found fragments of manuscripts of every book in the Old Testament except Esther. Some whole books, like the book of Isaiah, were discovered. Scholars decipher these manuscripts, and here's what they discovered. The Bible we have today has been accurately copied down through the thousands of years because after a thousand years of copying, they found in Isaiah 53, for example, that there was only one word different, the word light, that didn't change the meaning of the chapter at all. The skeptics were wrong. And the Bible was right. Highly respected archaeologist Nelson Glick made the following claim. It may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. Scores of archaeological findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or exact detail historical statements in the Bible. Famed archaeologist and New Testament skeptic Sir William Ramsey began his study of the writings of Luke with sincere reservations. However, after comparing the New Testament documents of Luke with the available archaeological evidence, he wrote, I find myself often brought in contact with the Book of Acts as an authority for topography, antiquities, and society of Asia Minor. It gradually bore in upon me that in various details the narrative showed marvelous truth. There are no other books of other religions that compare with the Bible with regard to historical substantiation of its miraculous claims. In fact, most religious books have little historical basis whatsoever. I still say that the writers of the accounts of Jesus concocted the whole thing. They put in just enough historical information to make it sell. One of the problems with the idea that the gospel writers perpetrated fraud in what they wrote is that among those early recipients of the gospels were actual eyewitnesses of many of the events of the gospels with all their detail. It hardly seems reasonable that such writings would have been accepted by the hundreds of eyewitnesses, many of whom no doubt subsequently held leadership positions in the early church. In other words, the New Testament would never have gotten off the ground if either historical inaccuracies or significant inconsistencies were found in the text. Given then that the Gospels are historically accurate, their detractors argue that what is claimed by Christians is not supported by the evidence found in the New Testament. Some objections would be that Christ did not actually die on the cross, that he never claimed to be God in the flesh, etc. However, the documentation of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ as detailed in the four Gospels contains enough evidence to convince any actual court in the land that Christ died on the cross, that the Roman soldiers found it unnecessary to break Christ's legs in order to hasten his death, and were under orders to do so if he had been found alive as compelling evidence in itself. That a soldier pierced Christ's side with a spear assures us that he was dead so that there was no need to carry out orders to break Christ's legs. And that the resulting flow of blood and water, the spear that was placed in his side, indicates physiologically that Christ was deceased. This is substantial evidence that would be unreasonable to deny. Even if I can see that what's in the Gospels is everything you tell me, and everything sort of makes sense, you still haven't convinced me that the writers, the apostles, and even the so-called eyewitnesses didn't conspire to sell this hoax to the gullible of their times. Either they were self-deluded, or they did it for the same reasons people propagate religions today, prestige, power, and money. Both history and tradition tell us that those leaders who might have had something to gain in promoting a lie lived lives that were mostly impoverished. They were imprisoned, scourged, banished, and persecuted while maintaining their so-called deception. All but one of the apostles, tradition says, died a martyr's death. They were either so incredibly deluded by their own lie as to continue the charade through the worst of consequences without one of them breaking ranks and denying it, or they were telling the truth. There were numerous prophecies in the Bible which were fulfilled in the life of Christ which show that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. In order to blunt the 
force of this supernatural fulfillment of prophecy, critics have said that Jesus force fulfilled or manipulated events in order to fulfill these prophecies. This view was popularized in a book by Schoenfield entitled The Passover Plot. Just to show how ridiculous critics can get, let me point out that there were a number of things that Jesus could not possibly have manipulated. Right behind me is a classic example, the old town of Bethlehem. Micah 5.2 said that Jesus would be born in this town. Now, how do you force, fulfill, or manipulate where you're going to be born? The Bible also said that Christ would be crucified in the very time in which Jesus of Nazareth lived. Now, how can you force, fulfill, or manipulate events that lead to your crucifixion? The Bible said that Jesus would be born of a virgin. How do you manipulate that you're going to be born of a virgin? So the event of Christ's birth was not manipulated. It was a divine confirmation of his claim to be the Son of God. In order to avoid the overwhelming miraculous evidence that Jesus was the Son of God, many critics say that he never claimed to be God. This, of course, is contrary to the historical record. In Matthew chapter 12, they asked Jesus for a sign. He said, I will give you no sign except the sign of my resurrection. I'll be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In Matthew chapter 26, Jesus stood before Caiaphas, the high priest, not far beyond these walls in the temple area. The high priest said, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us whether you are the Son of God. Jesus answered, I am the Son of God. And furthermore, you're going to see me coming someday in power and great glory. There are many predictions of the Messiah in the Old Testament, and some of them came to an amazing fulfillment right here in Galilee. It was in a synagogue not far from here in Galilee that Jesus stood up on the Sabbath to read in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. He took the scroll from the attendant and read these words, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Then Jesus gave the scroll back to the attendant, and he said to the people who were amazed at his words, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, thus fulfilling the prediction that the Messiah God would come in the person of Jesus Christ. Along the shores of Galilee, Jesus entered into the city of Capernaum. There he entered into a house, and a throng of people had followed him to the house. In this house, he made one of his claims to be God. On this occasion, Jesus looked at a man whom they had uh, let down through the roof because they couldn't get in for the crowd, and he said, Your sins be forgiven you. The scribes who were standing around said, Who can forgive sins but God only? recognizing his claim to be God. Perceiving that they had said this, Jesus said, which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or arise and walk? In order that you may know that I'm the son of man, I'm going to say to the man, arise and walk. He did, and the man walked away with his pallet. Jesus claimed to be God, but he proved it by performing supernatural acts. Some time ago, a motion picture called The Last Temptation of Christ was released by Universal Studios. It caused a huge uproar. Many outstanding Christian leaders and theologians said that it was blasphemous. Although those who produced the film explained that it was not based on the accounts of the life of Jesus of Nazareth in the Bible, millions boycotted The Last Temptation of Christ. It depicted the historical Jesus as an indecisive man, a fornicator, a weak, unstable individual who wasn't sure who he was. Disturbing as this and other films are that give inaccurate presentations of Christ, they do accomplish one positive thing. They cause sincere Christians to reconsider the character of Jesus, his lifestyle, and the temptations he faced. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. This scripture comforts and encourages us in our struggles and temptations, but we need to consider it in the light of James 1:14 and 15. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, 
when it's finished, bringeth forth death. The historical Jesus did not have a sinful nature. He was not tempted by his own evil desires because he had none. According to 1 John 2.16, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Jesus was a man, and as such, he was capable of sin. But his temptations were external. Our temptations are internal and come from our own twisted, sinful natures. A close look at the last temptation of Christ shows us that it's really a story of a new age Jesus. On the introductory page of the script is this quote by the author of the book on which the movie is based. It is not God who will save us. It is we who will save God by battling, by creating, and transmuting matter into spirit. Now this is clearly a new age belief. The Christ character in the film is acting out of a role of self-realization. Through self-awareness, he is coming into the consciousness that God dwells within him. This too is a new age concept. This emerging Christ becomes a role model for us as we supposedly seek our own godhood. Whereas the biblical picture of Christ is of God becoming a man, the last temptation of Christ depicts a man struggling to become God. When the Jesus of the Bible died on Calvary, he died as a pure and spotless sacrifice for the sins of the world. Although he had been tempted, he remained sinless. Only in this way was our redemption possible. Jesus Christ did rise from the dead, and he left overwhelming evidence. In fact, the New Testament records that over 500 people saw Jesus Christ after the resurrection. He showed them his hands with the scars. He showed them his side. He said, give me fish and I can eat. Jesus Christ proved himself alive by many infallible proofs, the scriptures tell us, that he was the Son of God that he claimed to be. Some years ago, I was sharing with a skeptic, and he didn't believe that God existed. And so I gave him a brief argument for the existence of God that if the universe had a beginning, it must have a beginner. If the universe showed design, it must have a designer. Being convinced that there was some kind of God and therefore that miracles were possible, I gave him a book by a converted skeptic named Frank Morrison, Who Moved the Stone? The author narrates how he started out to disprove Christianity, but in the process of doing it, he wrote a book in confirmation of the resurrection of Christ. I shared this with my friend, and he read the book, and as I talked to him again, I said, what do you think of the evidence for the resurrection of Christ? He said, I think it's very convincing. And we bowed our heads together and prayed, and he received Christ as his living Lord and Savior. Some years later, he visited this very tomb. He was overcome with emotion and broke out in tears of rejoicing that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead and who vacated the tomb permanently on Easter morning. This same experience has happened to other skeptics. Lord Littleton, who looked into the evidence, was convinced that it was valid. Simon Greenleaf, the great attorney who taught for years at Harvard University and wrote the book on legal evidence, became convinced that the New Testament documents are reliable and that the resurrection is a historical event. Yes, for the skeptics, for the agnostics, for the atheists, there is a God who exists. He can perform miracles, and the resurrection is the greatest of all. And here is an empty tomb to testify to the reality of Christ who said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die.